to understand how the RNA actually transfers the information from a DNA into a protein, you're going to need to understand how the genetic code looks like. And that's actually what it looks like. What you may see is a bunch of ladders the RNAs can actually understand as a protein in the making. And there are some crazy scientists out there that can look at this picture and be like, I know which protein this is. And you never need to naturally get to that point. But you do need to understand that the DNA is based on a triplet code with every three bases representing one amino acid, which is called a codon. Basically, in this case, you have adamine, thymine, and guanine, and that specific sequence will represent a codon, which then represents an amino acid. And it's by translating this sequence that a protein is being made. So how does that work? Basically, the template strand of the DNA is transcribed into the messenger RNA. And when that's done, it's done based on base pairing rules. So you see, for example, if you have the ACC as a DNA code, the messenger RNA will be UGG because of base pairing rules. Notice that we substituted U for T, which should have paired with A, because in RNA, uracil replaces timing because uracil is more stable if it's not going to be bonded and and it's not since it's going to be an RNA. Either way, you see that the code is going to be transcribed into this act opposite by base pairing rules into the RNA code. Now, each of these RNA codes, every three letters represents a codon, which then represents an amino acid. For example, the first one is TRP, then PHE, GLY, SUE, and so forth. The sequence of the DNA code determines the sequence of the RNA code, which then determines the sequence of the polypeptide chain. That is the idea of how DNA actually works looks like. Do basically then DNA is based on the triplet code. Now why is it a triplet code? Let's think about that. You have four different kinds of DNA bases and you have three different codes, right? So if you do it that way, if you do three different codes for four DNA bases each, you're gonna have a four chances on here, four chances on the second one, and four chances on the sec third one. And therefore, the overall possibility of combinations is 64 different combinations. And that seems like a lot, right? Yes, it is. Look at all of them here. 64 different combinations of letters put together. You make all of this genetic code. We'll explain what this chart is in a second. Don't get overwhelmed. But, D, it, what if you only had two instead of having three? If you only had two, then you can only make four times four, which will make 16 different combinations. Why would that be a problem? Well, in humans, there are 20 different amino acids that you want to produce. And you also need to have the stop code on, which is the message to say the protein is done. And therefore, you need 21 messages at least. That means that 16 is not going to be enough. That means you need a triplet code with 64 different possibilities. But since you only have 21 messages and 64 different possibilities, some of the possibilities will say the same thing. Just like you know you say I'm well or I'm good, it's all the same thing. It means the same thing. And so you're going to have different codes meaning the same thing or different words meaning the same amino acid. Different codons will stand for the same amino acid. So there is some redundancy within the DNA code. The DNA code has different ways of expressing the same amino acid. However, each code will stand for a specific amino acid. A code can never mean, mean two things. You're never going to get something like to be, for example, which means to be in a place or to be something. Two separate meanings from the same word. All right? Or when, uh, when, for example, you say something like right, which means to go to the right or to be correct. And so that doesn't happen in the DNA message. The DNA code is specific. Each code means one amino acid. And that's pretty stable throughout the code. The other interesting thing about the DNA code is it's pretty much universal. Every single life form on Earth seems to obey the same kind of DNA triplet code. In other words, UUU means phenylalanine for every single thing out there. Now, that means that this code must have evolved early in the history of life and pretty much been stable ever since. Because 99% of all life forms have it, which means it's something that all of us share in common. So probably the first mother life form that from which all of us came from was using this code and it's still used since. But there are some exceptions to the rule and some life forms have extra amino acids, which means they have to have a little variety on their code and that means for them the code does will mean things which are slightly different. But these exceptions actually prove the rule. It proves that evolution keeps happening and it keeps changing the original thing. 
but there's very few exceptions which means this must be a very well adapted way of doing things because it hasn't evolved or changed in the four billion years of the history of the earth's life now there's some things about the code which are peculiar and i want to start with that first of all the idea that aug in rna code in other words when you get t a and c in the dna code so that's the dna code when it gets transcribed into RNA code, you're going to get A, which is the opposite, U, which is the opposite of A if you're doing RNA, and G makes AUG. Now, this particular codon is very important because it's going to be the start codon. Well, this will change in archaebacteria or bacteria, but for all life forms on Earth that are eukaryotic, Every single protein that's ever made by any eukaryotic cell is always starts with AUG. It has the same star codon, which again speaks of the common inheritance that we all come from the same original eukaryotic cell, which started the proteins exactly the same way. Now you can get AUG again later in the, in the sequence of the protein, but every protein will start with AUG if you are an eukaryotic cell. And that's basically called the start codon. You also have three codons, which means stop. And whenever the ribosomes get to this point or in read UAA, UGA, or UAG in the ribosome, that means that the protein is done. It's time to stop the process of protein synthesis. And so you have the star codon and the stop codons. The stop codons actually just basically send a message that it's time for the ribosome to release the protein and the AUG, though, it's the actual amino acid that starts every single protein in the eukaryotic cells. Now, let's actually look at this codon table and kind of understand kind of how it works like. If you have something, say, a DNA code that's A, 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 when you make an RNA code based on that, you're going to make the opposite. So it's going to be U, U, U. Which kind of amino acid is that? What you do is you go to the first base and say U, so it's going to be somewhere in this region here. Then you go to the second base, U, so it's going to be in this sets of rows and in this column there. And you go to the third base, which is U, which just tells you it, this is going to be the base that you want, phenylalanine. Now, what, let's do another one for practice sake. What if you get A, G, C, on the DNA code, that means when you make the RNA code, you're going to make the opposite, U, C, G. So you find the U, all right, that's the first set of rows again. You find the C, and you find the G, it's going to be serene. And you see how that's how the, you can read a codon table. Now, some codon tables look slightly different. They can sometimes look like this. So let's say, for example, that I gave you a DNA code that looks like this, T, C, and then G. And remember, this is going to be read on a three to five direction. So if I give it that direction there, so you can know where to start to read from. Which means when you make the RNA, you're going to make it on a five to three direction. And the opposite of T will be A, the opposite of C will be G, and the opposite of G would be C by base pairing rules. So you're going to have the code A, G, C. So you're going to go to the A quadrant, which is found over here, and then you move from there to the, to the inner outer quadrant, which is going to be this G here, and then you find the C, which is going to be there. So there you go, you found serene. But notice how interesting that whether or you have finished with the U or with the C, it would still be serene. And then notice that this is the whole redundancy thing that we were talking about before. For example, if I give you an RNA code that's U, C, C, I'm giving the RNA code this time, okay? That's going to be serene, C, U, C, C. It's going to be serene here. But it will still be serene if it was a U at the end, if it was an A at the end, or if it was a G at the end. So no matter what happens to this last base here of the codon, it will not affect the actual protein that's being made because all of these different combinations stand for serene. What that does for life is it makes it less likely for mutations to actually affect the protein product. In other words, you can change the genotype slightly without necessarily changing the phenotype because the code is redundant. So that's actually very good. And because UCC will always stand for serene, you never get uh, some sort of ribosome that misunderstands the message. And all of this is very important for the way the genetics works. And finally, finally, it's going to be important as well to start reading from the right place in the RNA. If you start reading from the wrong place, you're really going to screw things up because this codon here, for example, is UGG to stand for TRP. But if you start reading from the wrong place, say from here, that changes the entire message because it's every three basis, and now you're going to have a completely different message. GGU, UUG, instead of UGG, UUU. 
and that will definitely change the protein, which goes back to the whole things about mutations and how they actually affect the phenotype. Let's do an example that will actually review everything we talked about in terms of genetic code so that you can actually know how to look, work with this. If you have an RNA code that actually looks the way this looks, and I'm actually starting with the RNA code just to make things simpler, but if you gave it a DNA code, all you have to do is do base pairing rules to get the RNA code instead. But anyways, you would get the AUG, ACG, GAG, CUU, and so forth. Now, let's translate each one of those. For the first one, you should recognize that as the star codon, which is right there. So you're going to start with the star codon, which is, which is methanone. Then you're going to have ACG, so you're going to find A, column here, then C and G. Then so it looks like this is going to be my second amino acid right there, T-R-T-H-I. Then you're going to do G-A-G, so the G roll, the A column, and then G again. So it looks like glutamine is going to be my third amino acid. And then you're going to go through C-U-U, so on the C row, on the C column, and with a U in the end, looks like proline is going to be my fourth amino acid. And then you go to codon 5, it's going to be C-G-G. So you go to the C row, the G column, and then G at the end. Looks like arginine is going to be my fifth amino acid. And then finally, you're going to get through the codon 6, which is A-G-C. So A-G-C, you found it right here, serine. So the sixth amino acid in the seventh amino acid sequence, U-A-G. Let's see what that is. U-A-G, stop, we're done. So that means this is going to be a protein, the six amino acids long, and it has those codons in order. M-A-T, T-H-R, uh, G-L-U, P-R-O, A-R-G, and S-E-R, and then stop. So you see how the actual protein synthesis process works, and that's what the ribosomes will do to actually transfer the DNA code into the actual RNA code. But mutations will affect the way this is understood. In a silent mutation, you, normally it's going to happen when you change the last nucleotide to something that stands for the same thing because of the redundant code. And look at that. In this case here, you change the DNA template to an A, which changed the actual RNA template to a T. And, but even though you change that, the U still stands for the same thing, so you make the normal protein just the same. So it's a silent mutation. But... If you change the first codon, wobbles don't usually affect that. And so you're going to change the message altogether. And then instead of getting the glycine you're supposed to get, you get serine and you make a different protein. It's a missense mutation because you change the protein but still make a protein, period. Now, if the change happened earlier on and you made a change that actually caused a stop codon to show up, now you change the protein so much that it no longer makes a protein. It's a nonsense mutation. So you see how this just ties in with the chromosome inheritance chapter that we talked about. And look, notice that, for example, the cystic fibrosis that happens in, in red blood cells happens because of mutation in the second codon of a sequence, which changes an A into a U, which changes the normal hemoglobin that it has a GLU at one point to VAL at one point. And that will create, create a sickle cell that has the wrong hemoglobin and it destabilizes the efficiency of that cell to carry oxygen. So in the drawing there, for example, you see the difference between a normal cell and a sickle cell because of that single substitution mutation that actually changed the efficiency of the protein. Frame shift mutations are going to be the ones which are going to create the worst kinds of disruptances in terms of genetic mutations. Because in terms of chromosome mutations, that's going to affect many genes, it's going to make it even worse. But in terms of gene mutations, frame shifts are the worst. Some of them actually cause premature stop codons to show up and then you have a missense mutation immediately early in the, in the formation of the protein. But if the, this mutation happens early on, it might actually not actually cause a frame shift mutation that causes a stop codon, but instead it will change every single amino acid from that point on. Either way, that's going to also cause a extensive missense because it will make the wrong protein for sure, since every single amino acid past that point will change. And then another option, you actually might delete so much or add so much that you actually get an extra amino acid or an amino acid missing, but other, other than that, their actual sequence will actually be the same. But still, that will still cause a missense mutation because it will change the structure of the protein since you're going to be missing the correct amino acid sequence. And so here you see how mutations tie in with the whole reading frame and the whole uh, idea of the genetic code being what needs to be specific about the way it is. If you change the genetic code, you change the message. If you change the reading frame, you also change, change the message. Check it out. The one at the top is the normal protein you're supposed to make. But if you shift the frame one 
actual base over, you change the entire protein. Two bases over, you make another entire protein. So you see it's very important to start copying the messenger RNA and start the protein synthesis from exactly the right place. And when we do protein synthesis, we'll talk about how the body makes sure that this will happen.